In 2020, parkour has become a booming economy. Now, more than ever, athletes are setting up clothing brands, self-funding their own films, creating parkour-specific shoes, and hosting major events. However, this hasn't always been the case, and one man alone nearly destroyed the entire parkour economy. In this video, we're going to explore the strange story of urban free flow and how the meteoric rise of this one-stop shop for parkour and freerunning took a dark turn. The year was 2003. A short documentary by the name of Jump London was released on Channel 4 on the 9th of September. For the first time, the world was shown the art of parkour on their TV screens. Athletic men leaping across the roofs of London like superheroes. It was every 13-year-old lad's wet dream. In unison, every young boy of the nation put down their Pokemon cards and head outside to replicate what they saw in the short one hour documentary. Quick to notice the potential untapped gold mine came along one man, Paul Corky, better known as Easy Styler. Because, well, back in 2003, you weren't a real parkour athlete or tracer unless you had a cool parkour name. In fact, we kind of struggle with the word parkour, so we got renamed to free running, but let's, let's not get into that right now. Let's get back to Easy Styler. The former boxer saw the rising fad-like status of parkour and instantly recognised the opportunity to generate money from the sport. The goal for him was to replicate the skateboarding business model of sponsored athletes, videos and clothing. Within the same year of Jump London being released, Easy established Urban Free Flow, also known as UF. Easy was a hard-working, smart and very ruthless businessman. With his quick moving and forward thinking attitude, Urban Free Flow very quickly became the biggest and most prominent group within the scene at the time. As the rapid growth of parkour accelerated, so did Urban Free Flow. However, this wasn't to last. As the corporate structure of the group was compromised in 2005 when Companies House dissolved Urban Free Flow for failing to properly file their accounts and pay the correct taxes. Ouch. Easy's gold mine was quickly slipping from his hands. He was no longer able to trade under the name Urban Free Flow, the very thing that he'd spent the last two years of his life grafting on. His hard work growing his brand was all about to go to waste. That was until one sleepless night when Easy had a eureka moment. What if, instead of Urban Free Flow, we call ourselves Urban Free Flow? Nope. You didn't hear that wrong. Easy literally put a space in between the word free flow and then metaphorically convolted the hurdle that was placed in his way. After an awkward conversation with his previous business partner, Mark Torok, or his cool parkour name was M2, Easy was set to dominate the parkour industry and this time he didn't need to cut the check two ways. Urbanfreeflow.com was at this point a well-established website with many potentially hundreds of thousands of users, mainly known by its popular parkour forum. And for the young bucks out there, a forum is a place where, you know, cool old school freerunners with mohawks would go and argue about parkour and freerunning are actually different sports. Anyway, when the time was right, Easy would pull out his final trump card and place it on the table. That trump card came in the form of t-shirts, more specifically the Glyph t-shirt. This was the most popular and famous shirt in the parkour community. Everyone would wear it. Easy was very smart in the way that he kept his costs down. Easy would bulk buy very cheap t-shirts. He would then go to a warehouse in China and have them create a sticker that he could heat press onto the shirts in his garage by himself. This effectively cost him next to nothing, and the markup on these shirts were incredibly high. The glyph, or glyph, I can never remember how you're meant to say it, transcended urban free flow. The glyph itself became a symbol of parkour and free running. Every free runner would wear a t shirt with the glyph logo on it, probably also a hoodie, a pair of tracksuits, and a wristband. Some would even go as far as to get a tattoo. And I'm not even joking, when I Google urban free flow tattoo, I got more relevant search results when I searched parkour tattoo. That's how much the symbol meant to the parkour community. In Urban Free Flow's golden age, which you could say was anywhere between 2006 to 2011, Urban Free Flow provided the free running community with a place that they could all go and geek out on parkour. Urban Free Flow did everything for the community. They hosted the free running world cup, 
that was sponsored by Barclays, which was filmed and shown on the BBC. They created a magazine with incredible stories of parkour from all around the world and places you never knew would have even heard about parkour. They showcased the best athletes from around the world, the best spots, the best photography. They did it all and they did it well. When YouTube became a thing, Urban Free Flow were very quick to create the now infamous Glyph Media in 2007. And this channel was filled with endless, consistent content about parkour. It was great. And then came sponsorship. Easy created the Urban Free Flow team. The team was made up of the best athletes in the world, whose names would go on to be some of the most memorable personalities in parkour history. To be in the Urban Free Flow team was the most revered badge an athlete of the time could wear. So in came the sponsorship submission tapes. Every kid wanted to be the next UFF star, as it was made out to be so glamorous. As parkour grew, so did mainstream attention, and so too did the marketing appeal for companies, particularly movies and television. Parkour was a way to make your product or film stand out from the rest, at a time that no one else was utilising it. And with Urban Free Flow being the first Google search result you'd get when you would type the word parkour, Easy was in the money. Along with sales from his incredibly successful clothing, Easy had finally achieved the gold mine he had so long been searching for. Videos would pop up constantly of the behind the scenes of these film shoots, parkour performance trips, famously the Dubai ice cream video that has sadly since been removed, which was practically a movie of their all expense paid trip to perform parkour in Dubai. The Urban Free Flow team were living like stars, or so it seemed. As more and more work came Easy's way and more athletes were at Easy's disposal, Easy realized the power he held in this incredibly niche industry. If you wanted a free runner to work with you, you went to Easy. If you wanted to work as a free runner, you went to Easy. Easy held the parkour world in his hands. And for a while it worked. Easy would take young lads with incredible parkour skills and offer them to work in blockbuster films or on television. This was every 16 year old's dream. Everyone was happy. That was until Easy started to realize the power that he held. Easy quickly started to notice he was the sole arbiter of parkour work. People didn't have an option to work unless it was through him. And just how glamorous it looked to be in the Urban Free Flow team, Easy started to realize he provided athletes with more value than they bought in, or at least so he thought. But this couldn't last forever. Before I get into that, I wanna speak a little on EZ. From conversations I've had with former UFF members, I learned that there was a day that everything changed for EZ. EZ was described by most as a positive, happy-go-lucky person. People looked up to him and they genuinely liked him, but that all changed overnight. EZ, just like anyone else who trained the sport, loved parkour until he had an accident during the filming of Jump Britain. Easy swung off a tree branch, missed the landing, and he landed on his head. He fractured his skull and he perforated his eardrum. In that instant, everything changed for Easy. People noticed this in his attitude. He'd become very nervous to do jumps. He had stopped training parkour. The old Easy was gone. One of the original members, John Kerr, or some will remember him as Kirby, he has provided me a large amount of information on this story, so many thanks to him for that. As I mentioned, Easy held the keys to parkour stunt work. However, after Jump Britain was aired, John was contacted by a film company to go and do stunt work for a film being shot in Romania. Easy grew worried that athletes might skip over him as a middleman and then go on to create their own contacts in the film industry and not need him anymore. So, Easy declined the job for John due to this fear. John, who rightfully so was very annoyed, went behind Easy to contact the film crew directly and committed to working on the film. Easy then went a step further and demanded a cut of John's money as an agent fee, despite previously declining the work for him. Regardless, the film went ahead. One night whilst on the shoot in Romania, the studio called John into the office saying that Easy had been in contact, saying that all the payment to John needs to go through Easy. This was the final straw for John and roughly in 2007, he left Urban Free Flow. This was the beginning of the end of Urban Free Flow. Tensions were rising between EZ and the many talented athletes who increasingly felt they didn't actually need to be in the Urban Free Flow team to earn money in the sport. At least three times it was found that EZ was taking roughly between 70 and 90% of the money athletes were being paid for jobs. 
As I'm sure you can tell, that is a very high cut for an agent. There were a number of instances when athletes would see Easy taking something like 9,000 or 12,000 pounds out of the athlete's performance fee. Plus, on top of that, Easy would also charge his own personal fee for the work. There was only so long that this could go on before Easy's empire would crumble. No one I spoke to was quite able to estimate how much Easy might have made. However, I do have this one quote. Um, I have no idea. No idea how much you have made. I know that he managed to buy a Scarface mansion, in his own words, in Australia. You know, one with a massive hallway and spiral stairs either side of it when you come in. However, some estimate that he could have made more than £1 million sterling. After two years of leaving, John decided to rejoin. Was it the urban free flow family, the memories, the nostalgia? Who knows? Most people you speak to who did train back in those days, they would speak very highly of the time that urban free flow was at the top. It really had a community feeling, provided a worldwide family for these oddball kids who spent their time jumping on walls. And despite the management of the team, they really did make an incredible platform. In 2009, the second Barclay Card World Free Running Championship took place. This was a momentous occasion, broadcasted live on BBC Three. It had celebrity presenters. The event had approximately 8,000 people in the stands watching and 25 of the top parkour athletes in the world. After an intense competition of cheesy parkour moves and handstands and stuff you'll never see people do these days, the winner was Tim Sheaf. Tim Sheaf later turned into a figurehead for the vegan movement. He then quit parkour to solely focus on veganism. He then quit veganism to solely focus... Well, I, I don't really know what he does now, but that may be a video for another time. However, most importantly, Tim won. And in a symbolic gesture, Tim ripped off his bright yellow Urban Free Flow shirt and threw it into the crowd. And with that, effectively marked the end of Urban Free Flow. When Tim did that, he was making a statement. He felt he no longer needed Urban Free Flow and he could go at it on his own. And he wasn't wrong. Almost half of the original Urban Free Flow team left with him. This was a massive blow and practically took most of the team from EZ. Tim Sheaf, along with other ex-Urban Free Flow members, as well as some other very high-level parkour athletes, went on to create Storm Free Run. At this point, Easy and Urban Free Flow were quickly becoming the laughing stock of the sport. Not only were many athletes copyright claiming the videos that Urban Free Flow had re-uploaded, but Stora, the now biggest parkour team on the planet, they aimed their sights on not just Urban Free Flow, but Easy in particular. Right, Carl. Right, Easy. As a last ditch effort for Urban Free Flow to stay relevant, they hosted the now infamous Free Running World Series in 2011. This was to be an online competition that athletes from around the world would send their best submission tapes to win the Free Running World Series. What happened next was probably the funniest memory in free running history. Led by Callum Powell, whose video was unfortunately taken down due to copyright claims, the entire freerunning community took the piss out of the competition. Everyone was submitting parody submission tapes. To put it bluntly, the freerunning world series was an absolute failure for Urban Free Flow. Topped off by Stora hosting a freerunning world series results video in which Easy Styler himself interrupts the whole thing and kicks off. Uh, that just about wraps it up for two. What the fuck are you doing? I made a shot around here! I'm bald and I'm a- Ah, the good old days. The real results for the Free Running World Series were never actually announced, and Urban Free Flow pretty much at that point disappeared into obscurity. Oh, how the mighty fall. It truly was an end of an era. More and more smaller teams were starting to pop up and gain traction, and UFF had disappeared. Easy Styler tried to later rebrand the YouTube channel Glyph Media into a fitness slash bodybuilding platform called Flexdem. It gained little traction and quietly slipped off the face of the earth. It seemed this was it for Easy Styler. That was until a number of years later when this newspaper article emerged. You see, Easy was a very talented photographer, and since the demise of Urban Free Flow, he then went into fitness photography. After many years of the parkour world wondering, whatever happened to EZ? Well, the question was answered. I don't want to make any opinion-based comments on this, I will only quote what the article tells me. 
Paul Charles Corky, who is well known in the fitness photography industry, was found guilty at Kingston Crown Court in August of one count of digital penetration and one count of sexual touching. Easy was then jailed for two years, placed on a sex offenders list and banned from acting as a professional photographer without supervision for 10 years. Assuming that Paul served his full term in prison, he would have been released two years from the release of this video, so back in 2018. His website paulcorky.com no longer exists. Urban Free Flow, the brand, was later bought by Jason Paul and members of Ashigaru, whose last update was in 2018 saying that they're all too busy to continue the Urban Free Flow project. What was left of their YouTube channel, Glyph Media, still exists and I would thoroughly recommend you go and check that out. And whatever happened to EZ or Paul, well, no one quite knows. Maybe he's living in his supposed Scarface mansion. Many thanks for watching this video. I've been wanting to make a video telling this incredible story for quite some time. I also reached out to a very large number of athletes. Many were unwilling to even talk about Urban Free Flow. I would have loved to have heard a defense of EZ, but unfortunately no one was willing to offer it. If you did enjoy this video, please leave a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and comment below telling me your earliest memory of discovering parkour. Whether you do parkour or not, I would love to hear it. Anyway, catch you in the next one.